So this is kind of weird for me. It's a bit of a new look. I, um... Hey, thanks. I, um... I'm usually up here singing and leading worship. Uh, and today I'm not doing either of those, so it's a bit of a new look for me. Um, and there's a lot of people here, so that's pretty cool. Uh, my brother-in-law is here. He's in the back, Chris. Um, he said he was only coming in order to stop me from saying anything heretical, and then he'd laugh at me. So thanks for that, Chris. <laughs> Appreciate it. I said, wow, Chris. <laughs> Apparently there's a video of me. I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I, Jonathan had a video and he wanted to introduce me. So we're going to play that here in just a second. <laughs> Stop wow. <laughs> so, yeah. I think he says, Colton sucks. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, that didn't work. That's okay. We can watch it another time. <laughs> I'm not worried about it. No, I prefer not to. So, I won't say any heresy today. Um, That's cool. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. But I'll tell you what I will do. We're in a series. Oh, Mike, you're here too. That's awesome. Oh, a lot of family. This is cool. Um, I'll tell you what I will do. We're in a series right now called Tell Me the One About Jesus. So I figured I should probably tell you the one about Jesus and how he called Simon Peter and the first disciples. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 5 today. Um, but before we get into that, I want to give you just a little bit of context. I think it's important. Um, we want to know kind of what's happening in Simon Peter's life, what's happening in Jesus' life. So we're going to start at the end of Luke chapter 4. This is 38 through 44. And he arose, this is Jesus, and he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Simon is also Simon Peter. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to Jesus on her behalf. And Jesus stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her, and immediately she rose and began to serve them. So two things I want us to see here. One is that Jesus' word has power. Jesus rebukes a fever, and it leaves Peter's mother-in-law. And that's incredible. I know a lot of times in the Bible we read about these miracles that Jesus does. Sometimes we can take them for granted. But Jesus' word has real power. And now, Simon Peter's aware of this. So we're going to read a story about Simon Peter. It comes after this, so it stands to reason that he already knows Jesus. Jesus has been in his house, and he knows Jesus' word has power because he heals his mother-in-law. So that's it's pretty incredible. Verse 40, Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. So now he's doing what he did for one, for many. He can replicate this. His word is power and not just like a one-time thing. He can do this over and over and over again. He is laying hands on people, he's healing people, he's casting demons out, and then he rebukes them, and as far as why they say, you're the son of God, and he says, don't say that right now, that's a different sermon for a different time, we can talk about it another time. Um, but verse 42, and when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place, and the people sought him, came to him, and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. So Jesus has got crowds following him now. And it makes sense. I mean, if there's a guy and he comes to your town and he's healing people left and right, he's casting demons out, rebuking demons. Mm -hmm. And in Israel at this point, they've had 500 years of silence, which we learned about recently, where there were no prophets or anything. And they were like, God, what are you saying? Where are you, when are you going to say it? And all of a sudden, this guy comes, and he's teaching about the kingdom of God, and he's healing people. Yeah, I wouldn't want him to leave either. Yeah. They're like, stay here. <laughs> this is great. But he must 
preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. So, let's see into chapter 4. The stage is now set for our story. We have a little bit of context, and what happens next? Well, I'm going to spoil a little bit of it for you here. Um, because I want to tell this story. Doug wants me to use a different mic. Is that correct? Check one, two. How's that? Nice. I want to tell this story from as much, as, um, as much of Peter's perspective as we can. Because... There's a lot of stories in the Bible that we read about the disciples, and it's easy, again, to take these for granted. Just like, yes, this happens, this happens, this happens. But, like, let's dig into it for a second. So, Simon Peter's a fisherman. His brother, Andrew, is his partner. They have a boat, and they more than likely have some hired men. These boats could seat 10 to 15 people, so they wouldn't be able to fish alone. So they have some guys that come with them and fish. Their partners are James and John, sons of Zebedee. And they have some hired guys. So there's two boats, two groups of two, and then their guys. And on this particular occasion, they go out and they fish all night. They let down their nets and they haul them back in and they catch no fish. So they let down their nets again and they haul them back in and there's still no fish. So they row somewhere else, different part of the water, and they let down their nets and they haul them back in. No fish. Mm. And this happens all night. So by morning, you can imagine, these guys are pretty frustrated. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Think about it from this perspective. If you own a restaurant, right? You own a restaurant. You get all of your workers together, and you prep for your busiest night of the week. Let's say it's Saturday night dinner. That's your, that's your busiest night. And you know based on your track record that you need to prep a certain amount of food. So you get the kitchen together and you say, we need to prep this, 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 and this. You go over the specials with your employees, your, your waiters and waitresses, and you say, okay, this is what we're serving today. This is what we're not serving today. 86 this, we actually don't have any more of it. And, uh, and you all line up at the door. Everyone's in uniform. All the table settings are placed beautifully. And you're all there. And nobody walks in the entire night. That'd be pretty frustrating, right? Yeah. That would suck. <laughs> and uh, and uh, imagine that from Peter's perspective, that he and his guys go out with James and John and their guys. They fish all night. They get nothing. It's hard labor. They're toiling all night. It's now morning, maybe daytime. No fish are biting anymore. They're exhausted. They're tired. They're frustrated. Probably in a bad mood, I would think. So, verse 1, chapter 5, Jesus comes along. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's also the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. So after all that, now they got to put everything away. And the, okay, take all the silverware, send it up to the dish pit. Got to wash it all anyway. So, um, all that food, um, we can save some of it. This is not going to last. We have to throw that out. Oh, man, you know, we have to everybody clean up, you know, reset for the next day. Restaurant metaphor again. So they're washing their nets. This, this is awful. Verse 3, getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, Jesus asked him to put out a little from the land. Now, at this point, I think from Simon Peter's perspective, you go out, you toil all night, you let down your nets, you haul them back in, you catch no fish. You can't pay your guys for the day because you didn't get any fish, no fish, no food, no money. This is their livelihood. They go back. I'm, if I'm Peter, I want to go back to my wife. I want to like put all this away, put it behind me, and then just go to sleep, try again the next day. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he looks over, and Jesus is sitting in this boat. He's like, which, what? And he knows Jesus. And he's like, what? That's kind of weird. I mean, if I think about it like this. If a really well-known pastor was invited over to my house and he did some crazy awesome things and he taught, 
taught me some awesome stuff. That'd be great. But then if I like came home one day and he was upstairs in my office, sitting on my work computer, <laughs> on a Microsoft Teams meeting with my coworkers teaching them about Jesus, I'd be like, oh, that's awesome, but what are you doing here? <laughs> you could have, what are you doing here? You could have at least asked or something. I just, I would have said yes. I just, this is a weird surprise for me. Yeah. So Simon Peter looks over. And he's like, oh, this, um, I mean, like, that's fine. Maybe he thinks that's fine. Maybe he's annoyed. But he says that Jesus is in my boat. Okay. And Jesus looks over at him and they lock eyes. He's like, oh, he's, he talks, turns to his guys. He's like, he's going to say something. He's like, hey, Peter, can you roll me out? Peter's like, what? Um, uh, and maybe one of the guys behind him is like, yeah, but didn't he heal your mother-in-law? Like, isn't she well now? And he's like, well, yeah, but okay. And he does it. He's obedient. Yeah. Carrying on, still verse three, and Jesus sat down and taught the people from the boat. Think about this too. For Peter to row him out into the water, Peter has to be in the boat. So now Peter <laughs> rows him out and Peter's in the boat. He can't get anywhere. He's just like, great. Um, okay, so I've had the day that I've had. I didn't catch any fish. Jesus is in my boat. And then I row him out. And now I'm here with him as he teaches this crowd, this crowd of who knows how many people, hundreds. I don't know. We see that Jesus has thousands of people in the Gospels that are following him. Yeah. They're literally pressing in on him. He can't get away. So he sits in the boat and he rows out. And, and now Peter's like front row center for this. He's like, well, this is awkward. <laughs> and maybe, you know, he wouldn't have been able to row him out on his own. So maybe his brother, Andrew, is there. Maybe some of his hired guys. I don't know. You know, I did a, a little bit of research on um, Galilean fishing boats. And uh, there was actually one that was discovered in 1986. And when they excavated it, they, uh, they found they could date it to AD 33. So this is the hull of what a Galilean fishing boat probably would have looked like or been like at around that time. And then the next slide we have is the Galilean fishing boat recreated as a model of probably what it would have looked like with the rest of the full ship there, based on what they found. And I don't know about you, but that's not a lot of room. Yeah, I can see 10 to 15 people, but like, they can see you, Peter. <laughs> like Jesus, Jesus is right there. He's teaching people. And Peter's like in the back, like, I'm tired. I want to go home. Maybe Andrew's there with him. And he's like, oh, what are we doing here? This is odd. And uh, sorry about that. <laughs> the cool thing here, too, is that Peter is going to be put into situations like this for the rest of his life. If you read the rest of the Gospels, he's going to follow Jesus. And he's going to be in front of crowds with Jesus, learning from Jesus. And then if you read Acts, he helps establish the early church. He's going to be preaching to people. And this is just the beginning. And he doesn't even know it. But moving on, when Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And at this point, I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. All right. Jesus, I had a horrible night. Can't pay my guys. I don't have food for tomorrow. You're in my boat. We go out to sea a little bit, and then we go out even further, and now you command me to put down my nets? I'm confused here. This doesn't make sense to me. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And I believe that at this point, he says this, because Simon Peter is aware that Jesus' words have power and authority. Jesus, as you remember, rebuked Peter's mother-in-law, Peter's mother-in-law's fever, and it left her. And he healed all those people. And Simon Peter isn't being disrespectful here. There's no sarcasm. It's clear that he does respect Jesus. I mean, he's obedient. He gets back in the boat with Jesus. He rows him out. He might be confused, but he's doing it. 
He doesn't have questions or say anything up until this point that we're told of. And he calls him master. And despite his circumstances, his exhaustion, the way he felt in that moment, and the fact that he didn't understand why, Simon Peter obeyed Jesus' command. Yeah. He said, but at your word, yeah. I will let down the nets. Mm -hmm. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Can we go back to that, that model again? No, it's not a lot of room in there. But that's a lot of fish. Yeah. <laughs> to let down your nets, haul them up after nothing that whole night. It's daytime. Fish don't really bite then. They're breaking. You've got to say, hey, James, John, come over here, please. We can't haul this up on our own. Bring the rest of the guys. Yeah. They get in the boat, they come over, and they can't get it up, and then they do, and it starts sinking. Yeah. Two boats. That's a lot of fish. <laughs> to clarify, I, I do believe Jesus is performing this miracle to show both the disciples and the crowd, who is probably still looking on, that he is worth listening to. Yeah. Oh, that's good. He's worth trusting. Yeah. Notice that he didn't start with a miracle in this scenario. Mm -hmm. He started with teaching about the kingdom of God, and he finished with a miracle to emphasize that his message and his truth are real. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And that's kind of a startling statement that you would think. He doesn't jump for joy. He's not like, wow, look at all these fish. Jesus, you're so cool. No, Simon Peter recognizes yeah. that after Jesus' healings, Jesus' teachings that he's seen, and now Jesus' miracle of this catch of fish, that he is in the presence of holiness. Yeah. Yeah. Simon becomes acutely aware of how great his sin is, and how much it separates him from a holy God. Mm. And he may not fully understand yet that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is God, but he recognizes, based on all of these things, this man is holy, and I am not. Mm. In ancient Jewish tra tradition, under the Old Covenant, they were very strict about what was clean and what was unclean. And if you were clean, you could set foot in the temple and you could worship the Lord. And if you were unclean, you could not. You were ostracized because you were unclean and anything you touched became unclean. And there was a certain amount of days based on what made you unclean that you had to wait before you became clean again. And then you had to show yourself to a priest to become clean again. Simon sees this and perhaps being a Jewish man, he was familiar with Psalms like Psalm 5, where David expresses how he feels. This is how David feels. And he says, for you, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. And there's some strong language in there. Simon Peter probably recognizes he's not a bloodthirsty man. But deceitful? Boastful? I can't imagine that Simon Peter has lived his entire life and never lied or bragged about anything. Yeah. Simon Peter is aware at that moment that his sinful heart is unclean in the presence of holiness. And he says, depart from me. I can't stand near you. I can't be near you. You're holy. I'm not. But that's not where it ends. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, 
Catch this. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. He says, do not be afraid. You know you're sinful. I know you're sinful. You know I'm holy. I know I'm holy. But do not be afraid. Jesus can say this because he knows what he came for. He came to take the sins of the world on his shoulders. And that includes Peter's. He knew what his mission was. He knew what salvation was. And he knew he was going to provide it. He knew he would take Peter's sin. And he knew that he would also take the entire world's sin. And that includes yours and mine. Mm -hmm. Peter's not the only one whose sin, without a covering, separated him from God. Mm. Romans 3, 21 through 25 says... But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That's a lot. <laughs> you're looking at that and you're like, Colton, that's a lot of words, dude. Manifested, propitiation, justification. What are you talking about here? Propitiation first is a fancy word for covering and justified in Merriam Webster is to prove or show to be just, right, or reasonable, to judge, regard, or treat as righteous and worthy of salvation. So what's the point? Here's the point. Through Jesus Christ's blood, shed on the cross for our sins and his resurrection, we are now given the righteousness of God. Peter said, depart from me. I'm not righteous. You're righteous. And Jesus said, I'm going to give you righteousness. Do not be afraid. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do not be afraid. So what do we do about it? Jonathan loves giving one big thing. <laughs> so I'm going to give you one today, too. If you, uh, if you get nothing else from this, if you write nothing else down, <laughs> if you remember nothing else from this sermon, please remember this. Jesus saving grace calls us higher. Yeah. It calls us higher. Mm. Jesus said, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. What does that mean? You're going to be making disciples. Yeah. You're not fishing for fish anymore. Yeah, You're coming with me. Mm -hmm. I'm calling you higher. Yeah, come on. So the disciples, when they had brought their boats to land, <laughs> they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed Jesus to catch men, to make disciples, to learn from him. Jesus proved his holiness and told Simon Peter he didn't have to be afraid in his presence. And this drove Simon Peter to action. He left everything he had to follow him. He even left the fish. I mean, look at that. We don't know that for sure. I mean, but that's pretty clear the way it's written to me. It says, and when they had brought their boats to land, Stop. They left everything. Okay. To me, this looks like these fish are amazing. But that's not what this is about. This is my livelihood. I don't care. You're worth it. Look at this. They left everything to follow him. We want to know more. We want to know you. 
And Simon Peter wasn't even special. He wasn't called because he was like better than other people. None of the disciples were. So we don't have to be special either. Like this, this applies to you and me. We're not special. Hate to tell you. (laughs) Sorry if that's a rude awakening. I had to figure that out at some point. It wasn't fun. Let me tell you. It's a very upsetting time of my life. (laughs) When you realize I'm not special. Oh man. But Jesus still wants to have a relationship with us. We're not special. Jesus is special. And he wants to know us. And he wants us to know him. And this call wasn't just for Peter. You will be catching men. He said to Peter. But in Matthew 28, this is called the Great Commission. A lot of people know it for good reason. Verse 16, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee And I'll just pause there for a second because it's corroborated in, I think, 2 Corinthians, and a lot of scholars agree it wasn't just the 11 disciples there. There were like 500 people there. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, there's action Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you to the end of the age. Jesus' saving grace calls us higher. He calls us to something. He said, I saved you from your sins. So I want you to do something about it. I want you to follow me. And we can see this in the story. The cool thing is here, you don't have to know how to do it. You don't have to even be in the mood. You don't have to have the perfect circumstances. Simon Peter had awful circumstances. And he didn't understand why, so you don't have to understand why. Peter didn't have any of those things, but he was obedient. But at your word, I will let down the nets. God may even be preparing you for something down the line. You don't even know about it. Like Peter in the boat. All of a sudden, he's stuck in a boat and the crowd's looking on. And he's right next to Jesus. He's like, this is weird. Maybe that'll happen to you. One of the hard things is this costs something. This cost Peter his livelihood, his comfort. I mean, think about it. He left his wife at home. What? It doesn't say that, but guess what I can, I can assume here is that it's Jesus and 12 guys in the ancient Middle East, and they are traveling roads, going to different towns and preaching the gospel. I don't think they had room to bring Peter's wife with them. He left everything because he said, Jesus, you're worth it. Yeah. I got to know you. Yeah. Matthew 19, 23 through 30 said, and Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Of course, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? (laughs) Who, Jesus? These people can't be saved? And Wealth was associated with God's blessing. My wealth, oh, you're blessing me, Lord. This is a, this is a physical manifestation of your blessing on me. He's saying, rich people, that's going to be really hard. Like, well, who can be saved if you're blessing those people? But Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters 
or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Listen, this costs something, but it's worth it. He's worth it. So maybe you're with me at this point. You're like, wow, yeah, Colton, agreed. Cool, amen. What do I do about it? What does that look like? Fair question. I'm just gonna give you three quick points here that I think can help in our daily lives. First one is listen for his voice. If Peter didn't hear his voice, he couldn't have done what he asked. If Peter was over on the shore and Jesus was like, can you row me out? And Peter was like, la, 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 la. I'm not listening, dude. That would never happen. Listen for his voice. Read his word. If Peter didn't understand the words that Jesus was giving him, then he couldn't have followed through with what Jesus was asking him. If he heard Jesus' voice and he said, can you row me out to shore? And Peter was like, I don't speak English. <laughs> like, like if he was just like, oops, don't know it. I don't know what you're talking about. And he couldn't have, he couldn't have even put himself in that situation and followed Jesus. And trust him because he's already shown he's worthy. If Peter didn't trust him, then he couldn't have said, but at your word, I will let down the nets. But at your word, that requires trust. Mm -hmm. If you hear Jesus' voice and you understand what he's asking, but you're like, nah, I don't know about that. (laughs) That sounds crazy. (laughs) Let down the nets. I'm telling you, man, we didn't get anything. I'm not going to do that. Mm. You don't trust his word. Mm. Where's the follow through? You can't. You can't let him do what he wants to do if you don't trust him. But ultimately, this all boils down to obedience. Hearing his voice means nothing if you don't then do what he asks. Reading his word means nothing if you don't then put it into practice. Trusting him means nothing if you don't then follow him. And no matter where you are in your walk with Christ, we can always learn to follow him more closely. Jesus calls us higher than ourselves. Mm -hmm. Luke 9, 23, Jesus says, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. He hadn't even gone to the cross at this point. They're like, that sounds gruesome. It can be, it costs something, but it's worth it. And it's a daily thing. No matter where you are in your walk with Christ, on a daily basis, Mm -hmm. you gotta say, I give it to you, man. I surrender this. I don't don't get it. I'm not in the mood, but I give it to you. This is hard. This feels like torture, but I trust you. Mm -hmm. I believe you. We may not be called to leave all our earthly possessions to follow Jesus. Very few people are, but he still calls us. It could simply just be in a different way. For me right now, that looks like speaking today. That's surprising. For you, it might look like respecting your boss when they're not being very respectful. That's a way to follow Jesus. He tells us to do that. It might be loving your brother when they're not being very loving. Wow, man, you're being a jerk. But Jesus tells me to love you. I know. But that's what Jesus asks us to do. So if we trust him, we hear his voice, and we understand that in his word, and we're obedient, then we'll do it, right? And if you don't know Jesus, but you're feeling him speak to you right now, lean into that. Worship team can come back up. He is good. He is trustworthy. And he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have a relationship with you. 
And if you're wondering how to even begin that relationship, let me walk you through that really quick. Believe that he is who he says he is. A perfect God that lived a perfect life as a man, died for your sins, and was raised again in triumph to defeat death. And he did this because he loves you, he wants to have a relationship with you, and so he could give you eternal life. John eleven twenty five through 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. He is who he says he is. He says he's the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. So trust him as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray, and I'd ask everybody to bow their heads. And close their eyes, please. If you believe what we just talked about, I want you to pray this next part with me. No matter where you are in your walk with Christ, maybe you're coming to him for the first time. This is new to you. Maybe you're in the middle of it. Maybe you feel great right now. Reaffirm it. Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are God. I believe that you came to earth. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were raised again in order to give me your righteousness. And I believe you're calling me higher. I believe you want to have a relationship with me. And I want to have a relationship with you. I want to follow you. Help me follow you daily. Daily. You can stay seated if you'd like. We're gonna worship Jesus here in a minute. And if this is new for you, reflect on that, pray to him, thank him for what he did. If you wanna sing, sing. If you wanna stand, stand. But let's give our hearts to him.